We live, we love, we serve. Family. We live, we love, we serve. Amen. Listen, turn with me today. I'm going to be brief. Time is already nine, but Mark 10, beginning at verse 17 through 27. Familiar story, but I want to focus on a small portion of it. Mark 10. 17 through 27. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's pray. God, we thank you all today. and We do not take this breath for granted. We do not take our lives for granted. It is amazing, oh God, how we can journey through life. And the truth is, we do take life and breath for granted. But God, we do not think on these things to be morbid, but we think on these things to be mindful. Mindful of the life you've given us. A life that we ought to live and enjoy and celebrate this amazing gift. So God, thank you. For you are the giver of this gift. We stand together in solidarity, oh God, celebrating how amazing this journey is. God, you know it is filled at times with challenges and difficulties, but that does not undermine how amazing this life is. With every breath we take, oh God, we say thank you. With every movement we make, we say thank you. Thank you. And, oh, God, as you love on us, we will love on others and ourselves so that we can honor who you are and how you are in our lives. We love you, Lord. We honor you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Remain standing with me. I just want to read um, from verse 23. Then. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Got quiet in here. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things, all things. Somebody say all things. All things are possible. Amen? Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand, clap of praise as you take your seat. When we declare those words that we recited, our identity statement, we believe that those words are signifiers to who we are as a congregation. It is our identity. 
Identity is connected to sometimes physical traits or behavioral traits that shape who you are. For us, those words in our statement of identity capture who we believe we are, visionaries, dreamers, doers. And then it also speaks to our connection to God, our relationship called by God, commanded by God, and commissioned by God that speaks to not only our, act, our, our identity, but our actions that shape our identity. I love those words. If I asked you what was your identity, what would you say? What are the things that mark who you are, that are a sign about who you are? Who fundamentally are you? Because that is connected to identity, to how you show up in this world, to how you bear witness to who you are is part of your identity. Too often we find ourselves being defined by just what we do, sometimes just what we say. We have a tendency to create an identity through those actions that sometimes might not line up with how we see ourselves. So if you think about it for a moment, what is your identity? Oftentimes, our identity is shaped and connected to the things that are important to us within ourselves, about ourselves. Our identity is connected to the environment we've grown up in, to the families we are part of. Our identity is shaped by all those factors, family, by friends, by community, by all these things that shape us because oftentimes what we hold valuable and important and critical helps to shape our identity. So I'll ask the question again for you to think about today. What is your identity? I did not ask you what is your disguise. Because the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is there are many of us who are not always clear about who they are, but they're clear about the disguises they wear that keeps us at a distance from who we may be. Sometimes we're not always comfortable showing up in the world a particular way. We're not always comfortable being true to ourselves because of the issues we may have with those identifying traits, physical, but more so behavioral. We're not always comfortable with who we really are, especially when we think that somehow we need to be something other than who we are to gain access, to gain attention, to gain validation, or to gain worth or value, period. Identity is important, it's critical, but it's something we don't always think about. We just go through the motion, we get up every day, go through our routines, and we just keep showing up certain ways. And even if you're not clear about your identity, trust me, people are creating an identity for you. And sometimes how they see you is connected to how you show up. Even when you don't take the time to reflect on who you are, people are always watching. And we don't always want to talk about how we show up and how we present ourselves that are connected to identity because the truth is none of us show up in a way that is divorced from our lived experiences, good, bad, or indifferent. Our lived experiences have a way of shaping our identity, whether we know it or not. Sometimes we're actually creating or we're reacting where our identity is shaped by what emerges from us or it is shaped by what has happened to us. But all of that contributes to shaping our identity. For example, if you're a person who has been wounded, who has been damaged, sometimes you show up in ways to either protect yourself or unknowingly at times you end up showing up in ways where you find yourself doing harm to others because of the unreconciled damage in your own life. I was in Philadelphia this week, and I told folks something I read. I can't remember where I read it from, but it said this. If you don't heal from the hurt you've experienced, you'll end up bleeding on people who did not cut you. So in some ways, you have to be able... Whether it is that pain or hurt, it has to be not an identity shaped by just what has happened to you, but your commitment to what is birthed from you. I said all that to say this, that we have also a third, another way of understanding our identity with the things that are important to us. That those things are important to us, not just 
things that happen to us, but things that are important to us. Because sometimes the things that have happened to us, yes, it could be bad, it could be amazing, but all those things that happen to us, then in relationship with the way we see ourselves, help shape our identity. But then there's this other piece, this notion of our identity is then shaped by things we hold valuable, things we think are important, things we think are critical. You see, this scene in Mark 10 is about many things, but one of the things I found it to be is about identity, about the things that are important to us. The scene seems harmless on some levels. You, you see this, this young man, and some, some titles of this scene call it the rich young ruler. Some just say the rich man, depending on whether it's Matthew's or Mark's version. But what's interesting is that in this scene, the young man comes to Jesus, and he says, good teacher. And I'll pause for a second because this is interesting. I didn't really want to, I'm not talking about this part today because it'll open up Pandora box for some people. But, but, but Jesus makes a clear distinction in his response to the man, a separation between him and God. He says to the right there in the story, he says, he said, why call me good? No one is good but God alone. He makes a distinction between himself and God, right? And, and, so, and so Jesus didn't ask, well, well what, what, what would the commandments say? You know the commandments. And he didn't reverse it. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Honor your mother and father. He calls it. And then the man says this. He says, um, I've done all of that from my youth. Pause for a second. He comes to Jesus asking, what must he do to inherit eternal life? Jesus names it, and he says, well, I've done that already. In other words, the man makes it clear, the things that qualifies you in his mind for eternal life, he already does it. Now, it makes you wonder whether or not he genuinely came to Jesus to ask a question to find out how to access eternal life, or sometimes what we do, we raise questions to draw attention to what we've already done. We don't always say that. Some of our questions are not always real questions. Sometimes we have a way of using questions to draw attention even to ourselves. In this regard, he asks a genuine, it seems like a genuine question, and Jesus tells him what's done, and he's like, I'm good then. I got it covered. I got eternal life. Now, here's the thing. Within Judaism at the time, there was always a path to eternal life connected to obedience to the law. And this man would have known that. The only reason he asks about eternal life is because probably he's a Jewish person as well and is talking to Jesus, the teacher, the rabbi. And he asks this question, but he also comes already knowing what he has done in some ways. He doesn't really want to know what to do. He just wants confirmation that he's going to get eternal life. This is why he asked the question. He wants to get eternal life. He wants to experience eternal life. Now, this is deep because one of the things that differentiates Jesus' teachings from what was traditional in Jesus' day is this idea that eternal life was an experience post-death. Jesus makes it quite clear and throughout the teachings in the Gospels, the synoptic ones, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that eternal life is about your disposition now. He says the kingdom is where? within you. You got to get that. It is within you, which then suggests that instead of a destination to get to, it is a disposition to arrive at. It's a disposition that emerges from you. I kind of alluded to this last Sunday when I talked about the kingdom, but, but it is. It is the kingdom of God is within. So, here it is. Eternal life then, just like hell, can be experienced in your living. Because if I ask you, have you ever experienced hell in your living, a whole lot of us are going to say yes. Have you experienced hell? Yes. Have you had some hellish times? Yes. Have you ever felt like you were in hell because of something you were going through? Yes. If you can verbalize that you've experienced hell, been in hell, felt hell, then the flip side is also true. You've experienced the kingdom, felt God's presence, understood the power of God that was moving and all that. So you can't give all the credit to hell and not say I've experienced the kingdom the same way. I've experienced that peace, that tranquility that comes when you're in connection with God. I've experienced the love and the happiness and the joy that comes when you experience God. Now, as one who understands that you've experienced hell and you've experienced a little bit of the kingdom in your living, the question is what will shape you more, your hellish moments or your kingdom journey? That was digression. I digress for a second. But back at the story, Jesus hears a man, and I believe just based on the context, Pastor Joe, that, that this man wanted validation. Now, pause. Let me give a, you know, uh, 
plug. I talk about this in the book, by the way, that's my shameless plug. This need for validation, right? Yeah, yeah, we often all want validation. We want to know either we're doing the right thing, we're on the right journey, we're following the right path because we don't like consequences connected to doing the wrong thing or we don't want to seem like we've made mistakes. We always want validation. I'm convinced this man wanted validation. He wanted to hear from Jesus himself that he was following the right thing. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus hits him with the commandments. The man says, I'm good. I've been doing it since I was a kid. I got it covered. Eternal life is mine. But here's where it gets interesting. Jesus says this. The scripture says this. But Jesus looked at him and loved him and then told him what he lacked. You get that? He looked, he loved, and then told him what he lacked. Somehow, his communication of what he lacked was connected to Jesus' love. He loved him so much he was about to tell him the truth about himself. Because in some ways, that's what real love is. I, I, I don't want folk around me who say they love me but are unwilling to be honest with me. Ah, see? Well, let me back it up. Let's flip it around for a second. Maybe a sign of your personal maturity is when you can have friends around you who feel comfortable telling you the truth about you with not without fear that there will be repercussion from them because you told them the truth. That's the real issue. you got to be big enough to handle other people's truths that they experience. And here it is. You know the difference between someone who's being negative, nasty, and trying to infiltrate your space with negativity and someone who loves you enough to tell you the truth. Why? Because the experience you've had with them has been rooted in love, even if it's been challenging. But the sign of your maturity and the sign of real friendship is when folk around you love you enough to tell you the truth about yourself, even if it causes discomfort and a little pain. I hope I'm talking to somebody here today. You need to understand that. You can't get to the point where you only want people around you who affirm your own assumptions about you. You can't just want to have people in your life who just say yes to everything you do, who don't challenge you, who don't make you better. Matter of fact, let me back up for a second. I need folk in my life who can be so honest that their honesty makes me the best version of who God is calling me to be. That's what it is. I need you to help me be better. Don't let me language in my assumptions about myself that may not make me better. That's what love does. Because if I love you, I feel a personal investment in your well-being. I want to do things to show you that, and I want to show up a particular way. Because if I love you, I'm willing to do that. I can't just say I love you and want to bless you. Well, no, yes. Because sometimes the biggest blessing that anyone can do, and the biggest gift, the greatest gift that anyone can give, is their honesty. Their honesty. Don't let me walk around delusional about the illusions I created about myself if you love me. <laughs> now, if you don't love me, fine. <laughs> what if you love me? Jesus loved him. He said, hold on, loving him, he said, this one thing you lack, take all that you have, sell it, and then give the money to the poor. Now, I'm going to come back to it, but let me move the story real quick, and then we'll be done. Look what happened real quick. Oh, hold on. Well, oh, yeah, they flashing across the screen. <laughs> don't, don't get caught up in the sermon. Your car gone when you, <laughs> when you come out. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Jesus says it, and the man leaves. There's a word there called lupeo, grieved. It only shows up in the Gospels another time when Jesus was praying in Gethsemane. That word lupeo, grieved, shows up there again. He was grieved, agonized by what he heard. And he walked away agonized, wounded, hurt. It said because he had many possessions. And then Jesus turns around to the disciples and said, boy, it's going to be hard for rich people to get into the kingdom. <laughs> and they sitting there shocked. Because you got to understand, in that day, 
that the assumption was those who were materially wealthy, just like those who were afflicted was viewed that they did something wrong, those who are wealthy must have done something right. This is why the disciples said, well, then who can be saved? Because if their blessings are connected to their righteousness, and now you're saying even those who are righteous because of their blessings and, their, and they can't get access, who can be saved? Because Jesus had just said that it's easy for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom, a wealthy person to enter the kingdom. Now, first, let me tell you that Jesus really is really speaking metaphorically about eyes and needles. The really reference to the eye of the needle is really the gates that they enter into the city on. And sometimes those gates are narrow. And camels, those who have camels who will pack things on the camel, have to unload the camel. That's another metaphor. Have to unload the camel before they can get through some of the access points, the gates to the city. That they can't get through, camel cannot get through when it's too loaded. Oh, God. That's not what I want to talk about, but you get the idea, the implication, right? That sometimes there's some spaces connected to the kingdom that is difficult to access because of all the baggage you got on you that you've been loaded down with in your life. I'm not going to talk about that because y'all trying to get me there, but I'm not. And, 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 but that's an image. So, so the eye of a needle was difficult for camels to get through if they were fully loaded. He gives an image. It's easy for the people to understand. Now, you know, he's not really speaking about a needle and a camel. Because somebody told me, can't no camel get through the eye of a needle? The eye of a needle is a reference to a particular gate to the city, okay? But the point is this. He makes it clear. Now, some of you are sitting here saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I worked hard for this bread. <laughs> and I come to church and I give, pastor. So you're telling me that I can't get into heaven because I got too much money? Remember I said this sermon is about identity. It's not about what you have. Hold on. That's Jesus' concern. It's about what has you. That's the story. That's the story. Jesus senses that this man's possessions are defining him. That he sees himself through the lens of what he has, which means that what he has actually what? Has him. That's the issue. It's about the things we think identify us. And for this man, his possessions, his wealth was the thing that identified who he was. It was who he, he was synonymous with his possessions and his wealth. And he could not imagine, he could not imagine being separated from his stuff. He had spent not only time accumulating things, but clear, clearly he had also spent time seeing himself through those things. So it is not really what Jesus is saying. It's not that if you got money that you can't enter heaven. The issue is if money got you, it's going to be difficult. Because elsewhere he says that you can't serve God and money. He makes that clear. So it's not that you don't need to possess. Because here's what I think. Here's what I believe. I had to think about it. If I had to think about this story, and, and, and I think it could have gone a different way. I think that if Jesus puts that out there and the man says, good, I'll do it. The story is different. I'll do it. And then I believe Jesus might have said something like, and this, don't say it's in the Bible, it's not, this is me. Right? He might have said, nah, keep your stuff. I just wanted to see how much your stuff had you. You see? So remember, identity is shaped by what happens to us. Identity is shaped by what emerges from us, but then identity can be shaped by what's important to us. This question, this story is really about those of us who are here trying to find out what is important to us. What is important for us? What, as we live this life, we walk this journey, what is important to you? What are the things that have you? What are the things that have a stranglehold on you right now that you know are not good for you, that you can't stop being connected to? What are those things that you know are working adversely against you that you've now built your identity around that you know is futile? 
This is a sermon, this rather, this is a scripture and a sermon about introspection, the capacity to look at yourself and be honest about yourself. Because sometimes what makes it difficult to navigate this life is our own dishonesty with ourselves, about ourselves. And here's a deep thing, but it's hard to fool yourself. Can you imagine living, some of us can, living every day around lies, illusions, and being delusional about it, and then you don't really have a full grasp on who you really are. This is why you get that achy, unsettling feeling. Wake up sometimes in the middle of the night, don't feel good, can't figure out what's wrong because something within you is screaming for you to be you. Something within you is screaming for the real you to show up. This is why you feel off and here you are. You have the things that you wanted, the things you dreamt about have now come together and fallen into your lap. You have it and you still don't feel right. Something is still off. Something is not all together. And can I tell you, the thing that is off is not the accumulation of more things. The issue is, have you learned to accumulate yourself? That's the challenge today, beloved. That's the issue. How committed are you to you? What are you willing to let go of so you can hold on to yourself? What are you willing to be honest about and real about with yourself because you understand that you've gotten to a point in your life where I said the disguises no longer work because the disguises are always revealing the cracks and the chinks and the armor. What is it about you that you know you need to work on so you can be the best version of yourself? What are those things that you have become important to you, so important that you lost a sense of yourself? What are the things that you are high, holding higher than you? Can, you? can you hear this part? Here's the thing I love about this, because this journey is difficult. The journey of self-discovery and coming to arrival of who you are is not an easy journey. I already said earlier, if you've had some real traumatizing damage, accessing your own authenticity is difficult. So it's a journey. It is not an easy thing. It will be moments where you start and you falter. You start and it falls short. You start and you stop. That's the nature of the journey. Don't beat your head yourself over the head because you've fallen short or because you're still gravitating towards the things that you think define you when they really shouldn't define you because it is a journey. You can't say, I got baptized today and all of a sudden everything changes tomorrow and now you're perfect and everything's in order. But that baptism says you're beginning something and you're beginning in this journey and all of us are on these journeys of self-discovery but our identities are important. Who we are and how we show up says something about how we feel about ourselves and here's what I know. There are some things that make it hard to get to the truth of who we are because they're too difficult or the difficulty is connected to the pain and it's too painful. I don't want to revisit that in order to be me. And sometimes you got to revisit the thing that has damaged, the thing that has hurt, the thing you don't like in order to find yourself again. That's the key. So part of the quest today is to enter that journey of discovery so that the things that identify you are the things that actually make you a better human being. Can I tell you, clothes don't make you a better human being and things don't make you a better human being and money doesn't make, can I tell you, actually money exposes who you already are. You know that some people say, boy, if I just got, if I hit that lottery, I'd be good. Well, if you wasn't good before the lottery, you're, not gonna be, you're just going to be the same you just with a little money in your pocket. It ain't going to change you. And you may be saying to yourself, Pastor, I've tried. I've tried. I want you to hear this. I've tried. Like the man, I've done it. I've done it. Since my youth, I managed it. I handled it. I can do it. You hear that? I have the I, I've tried, Pastor, I, I, and that is part of the problem. You don't live this life in a vacuum. You do not live this life by yourself. And can I tell you, as a believer, here's what I learned. There's some things I cannot do without God. When the disciples say, well, teacher, who can be saved? He said, it might be a little tough. If you're on that I journey, I can do it, and I did this. He said, but with God. Oh, I, 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 I'm sorry. Maybe that hit me a certain way. 
but I know how it just hit me when I said it. That but with God. Oh my God. That line, but with God. But with God. There is a lot I've done in my life, but it doesn't compare to what I've been able to do with God. You got to get that. That there's some things I've achieved, but there's some things that could not be achieved without God. Why? Because with God, me and God together, co-creating and making this thing beautiful, with God, all things become a possibility. I hope I'm helping somebody here today because I know it can be difficult to be your authentic self and to identify yourself in ways that make you a better human being, but you do not have to do it by yourself. But with God. God. There are people who will make assumptions about you because they've seen you do things that they talked about they didn't like. You got to tell them, let them know this. But with God, it does not yet appear what I shall be. You may think you have a hold on me because you see me at my worst. But with God, anything is possible for my turnaround. With God, all things are possible. The idea that you and God are co-creating on this amazing journey of discovery. And the only thing that's required of you on this journey with God is your honesty with God. Your realness with God. And things start moving and happening in your life. Not by yourself, but with God. God. Those three words can be the thing that can take you out of some spaces that can further deepen damage but with God. There have been moments in your life where you didn't know how it was going to come through. You had no idea. And here's what you did. Here's what you said. I tried everything I knew I tried, but with God. You, you, you ever have God move in your life and it seemed like God wiped out the mistakes in an instant and set you on a new path, but with God. You ever been in that place where you're about to lose your complete mind, about to do things that you could not take back? Something pulled you in. But with God. Those moments, Joyce, when you got that word and you heard the doctor say things you didn't like and you thought you were going to lose it, and all of a sudden you had to remember, but with God. Those three words might be the mantra for someone right now. But with God. I want to throw in the towel. I want to stop. I got tired of fighting. I got tired of living. But with God, something happened. That's why I love that song they sang. It's like a love song to God. You are more than able. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? And there's a part of that song down the road that said that God is still doing it. Just when you think it couldn't get any better, still doing it. Still moving in your life. Just when you hit that moment, that mountain peak moment in your life, you thought, this is it, God, this is it, thank you. God said, I'm not finished yet. You ever shout, I mean, lose your mind in praise because something's happening in your life? I mean, just mind blown, hands up, testifying, shouting, celebrating, want to invite other people into your joy. And then that night, you get home praising God, and God is like, I'm not even halfway through yet. Still. That's why I like to do things with God. Because when my energy runs out, 
God keeps on going. And what I really learned is sometimes when I'm on E, that's when God starts doing God's best work in my life. Because ain't a whole lot of me involved to mess things up at that moment. There are things that are hard on your own, and one of the things that are hard, one of the things that is hard, rather, is getting to a place to see yourself clearly. It's hard on your own. You ever cry out to God with tears streaming down your face? And just say, God, please help me. You've been in that place where you you were at the end of your wits, back against the wall. You couldn't see a way out. And you cried out to God, not knowing how God would do it, but just saying, God, please help me. You ever, you ever, you ever been there in your life? Where you just fell on your knees and said, God, do whatever you need to do with me to get the glory out of me. Oh, I know tears streaming down your face, but joyful that God has not forgotten about you. And then, here's the beautiful thing, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, when you least expect it, things start connecting. And things start happening. I mean, I'm not, hold on. I'm talking about the, the unplanned for things. Because I love when we have our plan and we show God our plan and God love. And then all of a sudden, our plan gets knocked out by God's plan. And then we look back over the whole journey with God and God's plan. And you say, God, you know what? I'm glad you tore my stuff up. And when you see God moving in your life, every now and again, you just got to take a seat somewhere. And, 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 and you're like, God, you are more than able. If you ever want to learn how to celebrate, learn the secret of reflection. Just sit down sometime and just start thinking about the delivery times. Just, just think about those moments that God swept in and started moving some things around. Just, just sit sometime. Think, think about how God is moving and then here's the deep part. If you can sit and reflect on what God has done and what God has already done and what God is doing, you can sit and reflect in the midst of your storm too. You can sit in a place of peace and you can say to the struggle that you see coming, come on, because I've been here before, but what you don't see is who's sitting next to me. What you don't see is what's around me. God is more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ever think or ask. God is able more than able. So no need to bleed on people that didn't cut you. No need to make decisions every morning what mask you'll put on. Just as I am. That's why the saints sit this way. I came to Jesus just as I was. Weary, worn, and sad. And I found in him a resting place. Hey, a resting place. And he has made me glad. We're about to leave. Do me a favor. Take a seat. And just reflect on the presence of God in your life. Just, just start thinking about how God, think about what your life was like before it was with God. 
Think about now what it is like. How many obstacles were removed? Come on, think about it. How much destruction was avoided? Think about it. How many times God didn't let you live with the mistake you made and was able to redeem it and turn it around? Come on. How many times you found out that when people forsook you, you were still not alone? God, you are more, more than able. Your presence, God, has kept us. Your power, God, has sustained us. Your love, God, has covered us. Your grace adorns us. Your joy keeps us. Your mercy delivers us. God, you are more than able. More than able. More. Hey, hey, hey. More. Hey, God. Amen. Amen.